everyone, welcome back to The Playing Guy with me, The Playing Guy. You are all very warmly welcome back to the channel, whether you are new or a returning subscriber. And today we're going to be having a look about how to do VFR flying. Now, VFR flying, visual flight rules, is the opposite of IFR flying. And as compared to IFR, you're generally not going to be as high. You're a little bit lower to the ground. So if you're the type of person that does mostly airliner type flights, commercial airliners, instead of 35,000 feet in something like, I don't know, a 737, about 500 miles an hour, you are probably going to be ended up flying something like PA-28 that goes, I don't know, maybe about 100 and about 3,000, 4,000 feet. And with VFR flying as compared to IFR, you don't really navigate with a GPS. Mostly when it comes to VFR flying, your primary source of navigation is what you can actually see out the window using the Mark 1 eyeball. So it is, actually, it is actually quite different from IFR flying, but at the same time, it is extremely enjoyable. Especially because flying quite close to the ground as well, it is a lot more scenic than what it is at 35,000 feet. So it is something that I do recommend. Now, I also want to point out as well that this video is not intended for real-world use, uh, even though it is actually inspired by real-life procedures. I myself have actually had my uh, PPL training, and obviously when you first start training to get your real license, you'll start learning to... Uh, well, you'll first go on your PPL license, which essentially teaches you all the basics and all the principles of VFR flying. Now, obviously, it is based on that, but then I have since adapted it for flight simulation because there's some stuff we can't do in flight simulator that can be done in the real world. So I just have to put that out there, okay? This is not intended for real-world use, and if you are, I don't know, trained to do your PPL yourself and you are looking for tips, then please do look elsewhere or you're better off asking your instructor. So, yeah, I've just got to put that out there. Please do not use uh, any of this, what I'm saying here, for real world use. So, just a bit of a disclaimer there. So, obviously, to begin with, we need to start off with the basics. I've already mentioned uh, VFR flying. You're not navigating primarily with something like a GPS. Obviously, if you've ever flown something like the 737, the GPS is sort of incorporated into the navigation display, and you've got a magenta. Well, as compared to VFR, using a lot more maps and you're looking for more what we refer to as visual reference points. Now these can be such things as, oh, there could be quite a lot of them. So you can have rivers, like say you can follow rivers, you can follow roads, uh, big cities. Uh, you can also use VORs practically in the same way as long as you don't breach uh, altitude restrictions. I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But then generally as compared to VFR with IFR flying, I would generally say you have a lot more freedom with um, VFR flying, so obviously if you follow an IFR flight plan, you have to follow that. Uh, whereas VFR, you have a bit more freedom. Now, you'll generally have a sort of a basic plot down, but then, like I say, you don't necessarily have to follow that. You are allowed to deviate. So that's something I'll definitely say. You have a lot more freedom, and for sightseeing, it's the perfect way to fly. And I'd also say there's less air traffic control restrictions as well, even though you are going to have to adhere with some air traffic control procedures. Uh, I would actually say as well that it might seem a little bit complicated, but once you've actually learned all this, and you've got a bit of practice in believe you me it does become a lot a lot simpler so that's all the nitty-gritty out of the way so quite simply let's begin okay everyone so the first thing we're going to talk about today is airspace now I'd say it's really important that you do need to understand airspace especially from a VFR perspective because I would say as compared to doing airliner flights stuff like that you're going to be a lot more um, you're going to have to interact with different types of airspace a lot more. And I'd say it can be a little bit more intensive from that type of perspective. So it's very important you do understand how airspace works, especially for VFR flying. So, Class Alpha airspace. This is mostly where commercial airliners fly. So if you're used to flying Boeings and Airbuses, this is where you'll be flying. Uh, the type of aircraft that fly in this airspace are IFR only. So no VFR. Uh, the only exception to this is special VFR. I will be doing a, another video about what special VFR is and all the ins and outs of that, but it's nothing you need to concern yourselves with at this particular stage. Obviously, all traffic uh, in Class Alpha airspace does need to comply. I don't know why I put compile with air traffic control at all times. And like I say, normal VFR flights, they're not permitted in this airspace. So one of the things that you are going to be coming across quite regularly, uh, especially within my videos, is this. This here is a VFR map. Uh, you've probably seen something like an IFR map with low airways, high airways. Well, this one is used for VFR flying. 
And as you can see, it's got a lot more land uh, masses here. So as you can see, it's actually detailing towns, road, rivers, and it's really, really applicable for VFR flying. Now, it also includes airspace as well. Uh, but just quickly before I talk about airspace, I do need to point out that um, these maps are incredibly helpful when uh, doing VFR flying and I do really recommend getting some. Now this particular one I do believe is slightly out of date, I think this is the 2017 one. In real life you should actually have up to date charts. Um, it doesn't really match on flight sim though, don't worry about it if it's for flight sim. Right, because uh, I was saying anyway that this is pretty much up to date, I'd, if I were to put a number on it I'd say about 90-95% accurate. But like I say, if I'm ever flying in real life I will use up to date charts. Uh, but you'll get away with it on flight sim. Right, that's enough waffling. Now, as you can see here, it's very self-explanatory. This here is class alpha airspace. Pretty much anything red here with uh, the red box with the white A in it signifies class alpha airspace. And as you can see there, we've got a number. This refers to altitude. So if we look at this sector alone, it's telling me that class alpha airspace is effective from above 2,500 feet. So quite simply, don't go above 2,500 feet. In this airspace, don't go above 4,500 feet. And in this airspace, do not go above 5,500 feet. It's very, very simple. Right, let's move on. Uh, class C airspace. Now, I should also point out that Class B is no longer effective. I think it's Class B and Class F uh, we no longer have. Yeah, it's Class B and Class F we no longer have, so don't worry about those. And Also, Class C as well. I don't... I can't ever recall seeing Class C uh, for whenever I'm doing VFR flying in the UK. I don't think I've ever come across it. I think this may be more of an American thing. I'm honestly not too sure with this. But either way, Class C airspace, this is affected from flight level 195 to flight level 600. And VFR and IFR traffic is approved within this airspace, but you will need prior permission. Now, Class Delta airspace, how does that work? Well, Class Delta airspace is the most common type of airspace, uh, common, most common controlled airspace you will be coming across with VFR flying. That's what I should have said. Okay. And pretty much class Delta airspace pretty much covers uh, CTR and CTRA around airports. Okay. As I'll show you in a second. Now the heights will vary with class Delta airspace. And within class Delta airspace, IFR and VFR traffic are separated from each other. And if you are VFR, you will need permission to enter the airspace before you go into it. I cannot stress that enough. Do not just simply go into a class Delta airspace without permission. You need to get permission first before you cross that line. So here's a good example, Gatwick. So as you can see here, this is pretty much clear as day, very self-explanatory. Gatwick CTA, as you see here, it's in purple with the white D, signifies class delta airspace. Yet again, you've got your altitude restriction there. Now obviously class alpha is above 2,500 feet, but directly below that in this area is the class delta airspace. Now if it, like say VFR traffic can go into class delta airspace, but you do need prior permission. So for me, I do an awful lot of flights from Shoreham up towards London. And for me, I usually navigate via the Haywards Heath VRP. I'll explain what VRPs are later on or in another video. Uh, usually I'll ask Gatwick if I'm at 2,000 feet. Hello, can I enter your airspace? And nine times out of ten, they do say yes. Uh, but like I say, you also need to be considerate of the altitude constraints. So 1,500 feet, okay? So say you're at Hayward Teeth and you're at 1,000 feet and you come into this airspace. Well, you're not actually in the class Delta airspace. So that there tells you where the airspace is effective to. Now, most commonly with CTRs, uh, usually they're affected from surface level, so you will never ever enter that area without having prior permission first, no matter what altitude you are at. Like I say, in this particular instance, you will not be above 2,500 feet. Uh, you, if you'll be below that, and in which case you do need to ask permission. And it's quite simple at end of day. Obviously, you've got big jets taking off and landing, and at some point they need to go below 2,500 feet when obviously they're taking off and they're on the approach. So obviously that helps ensures that you don't clash, okay? Because if you've ever seen an IFR chart, they'll probably tell you to not go below 2,500 feet, and that's a good way on actually separating uh, all the traffic. And as you see here, we've got uh, CTR, CTA, Class Delta Airspace for London, South End, all that stuff. Right, let's move on. Class Echo Airspace, uh, this is kind of the opposite of Class Delta Airspace for IFR traffic. So both IFR and VFR traffic are permitted in Class Echo Airspace. When it comes to IFR, 
they need prior permission before entering the airspace okay and they also need to listen to air traffic control similarly VFR traffic, they also need to listen and comply with air traffic control instructions, but VFR traffic do not need clearance into the zone, okay? Class Golf airspace, this is uncontrolled airspace. So if we just go back here to the actual chart, this pretty much here is uncontrolled airspace uh, below 2,500 feet. So this here is a good example of Class Golf, all right? And there's actually quite a big uh, chunk of Class Golf airspace uh, up north, uh, near East Lincolnshire and I think you can go up to as high as about 10,000, 12,000 feet uh, it will vary and obviously it's important that you do obviously look on your chart but pretty much uh, all the altitude below the Class Alpha airspace here is Class Golf and it's pretty much uh, uncontrolled really so effectively that means that you are effectively clear of air traffic control restrictions you don't need to call them up but usually there is a service in which you can actually call in real life that does help you usually this is either london information or low altitude radar service and you can pretty much just say hello i'm here and they can give you some minimal uh help now this is not applicable in that sim maybe pilot edge maybe ivao i'm not 100 percent sure how that works but i'm pretty sure they don't so that is something you don't need to worry about okay and then obviously within class golf you can do whatever you like within reason obviously if i'm in something like my cessna 182 the last thing i'm going to do is i'm going to take it up to 30,000 feet because quite simply the ceiling doesn't go that high even if i was allowed to do so but yeah like i say within this type of airspace you can do what you like within reason so obviously here we can go as high as 5,500 feet obviously and uh we're free of air traffic control restrictions. Now, we've just got another thing we need to briefly touch on, and this is aerodrome traffic zones, ATZs. Now, this is a small stack of airspace that is in place at pretty much uncontrolled airfields. Now, this will also go for airfields like Shoreham, even where there is a frequency and there is a controller. So let's just say we are heading into somewhere like Shoreham. There will be someone in a tower manning the frequency who will be giving off, as I refer to it, light air traffic control instructions. And you can obviously ask them for weather information and all this and all that. And they will be passing some basic information to you. But still, whether or not that's in place or not, the ATZ is still there, okay? Now, if there's any changes with that, that will obviously come up in the various manuals that throughout these tutorials uh, I will be showing to you and where you can actually get that information from. Uh... So yeah, the, the ATZ is still going to be effective there. And just quickly on the situation with ATC, I think I've only ever seen Shoreham Tower Online once, and that's within at least three years flying on uh, that sim. And within that scenario, it's very, very simple, and I'll explain about air traffic control procedures a bit later on. But what you need to know from an airspace perspective is that said ATZ is still in force, okay? despite whether or not there is air traffic control online. So pretty much when I refer to uncontrolled airfields, it's places like Shoreham, uh, you've got one there for Deanland, Lima Yankee Delta Delta, and stuff like that. Once you start practicing, you'll start to get a bit of more of an idea how all that works, really. But regardless of which, uh, they've got their own airspace. If the runway is over 1,850 metres long, then it's got a radius of 2.5 nautical miles extending from the runway centre point and has a height of 2,000 feet. If the runway is less than 1,850 metres, it's 2 nautical miles radius, but still 2,000 feet in height. Offshore stuff, so like drilling rigs, stuff like that, that's 2,000 feet in height, 1.5 nautical mile radius. Just ignore that. Um... MTAZ, MATZ, military air traffic control zones, self explanatory, pretty much military airfields. They're five nautical miles at 3,000 feet, unless they have their own sort of stack of airspace, which sometimes they can do. I uh, keep thinking Bryce Norton has one. I'm actually going to check on my charts now as we speak. I, I honestly don't know. Let's have a look. Uh, duh, 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 duh. Yes, actually I'm right. Bryce Norton actually has its own Class Delta airspace. So some airspaces, like I say, military will have that in place. Now, if you want to go through them, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can do. I'm sure I've seen a mate of mine go through Bryce Norton airspace. And like I say, we'll talk to you a little bit more about how you can use that in a second. But quite commonly, I'm just going to quickly go back to Class Delta airspace here. Uh, you are able to cross these zones, okay? You are still able to enter them, even if it is over a military airfield. Okay, so the next thing I need to talk to you about is the weather. 
very very important uh, when it comes to the weather because obviously uh, what you can do in IFR in regards to the weather and what you can do in VFR in regards to the weather is slightly different. Now when it comes to VFR flying you need to make sure that you are visual with the ground at all times and uh, obviously you need to make sure that you have good weather in order to maintain VMC, visual meteorological conditions, okay? And like I say, you need to make sure that you can able to see the ground at all times because that's the main point of reference for navigation. You also need to make sure that you don't go in clouds because unfortunately if you go in clouds, how do you know there's not another aircraft in the cloud? How are you able to see them? Okay, and plus your vision is then absconded. So just a quick sidetrack, if you ever go into a cloud, make a 180. Okay, so pretty much in order to ensure that we can get uh, VMC, that we can operate in VMC, we have some restrictions here. Now, obviously, these are based on the real-life ones. Now, just to say there's no real effective restriction on VATSIM. Uh, for me, I've done VFR in 500 meters visibility with a cloud base of 300 feet. For me, I wouldn't tend to do uh, long-distance VFR flying in that type of um, that type of visibility. I remember it was with a friend of mine. I uh, was at Bristol and wanted to do circuits, and all that happened was air traffic control just asks because uh, uh, that sim was on that sim, and um, there was air traffic control at Bristol, and they said, uh, "Are you able to still fly in this rubbish weather?" And they said, "Yeah." So, just a bit of an example there. You can get away with it, but be considerate. You may struggle a bit. Okay. The reason that we was able to do it is, like I say, we was a bit experienced and we knew what we were doing. We was also cheating a bit as well. Because we was using a GPS when we shouldn't have done. <laughs> but nevertheless, we'll talk about GPS a bit later on. But what is the minima? Well, minima, like I say, is the weather required for VFR operation. Now, if you're 3,000 feet or below, if that's where you tend to operate. Uh, for me, as I've shown in that example, I do quite a lot of flying around the south. Usually, I stick to about 2,000 feet. I very rarely go above 3,000 feet within this area. So, this would apply to me. We need five kilometers visibility, which having actually got the weather on this specific day for Shoreham uh, is actually quite good. It's uh, all the nines. So if you're familiar with reading a meta, you'll know what I'm talking about. So it's 10K plus. So from a visibility perspective, we're all fine. Well, there's actually a few clouds at 4,800 feet. OK, so from a cloud perspective, we're also good as well, because not only do you need that five kilometers visibility, you also need 1,000 foot vertical separation from cloud as well. So in this instance, a few clouds, 4,800 feet. Really, the highest I'll go is 3,800 feet. Very, very simple. Now, you also, and this goes uh, for pretty much everything horizontal, really. You always want to try and maintain at least 1,500 meters horizontal distance away from clouds. Now, this can be very, very difficult to do, but always try your best to do that. Now, if you're within an air traffic control zone, like I say, if you're doing something like circuits, then all you simply need is 1,500 meters vis, uh, sorry, 1,500 meters, C oh, sorry, I'm getting confused, I do apologize, because that should be feet. To start again, within an air traffic control zone, if you, uh, so say, for example, if you're doing circuits, you need 1,500 feet, not meters, 1,500 feet vertical ceiling okay and you need five kilometers visibility all right now if at any point you're going above flight level 100 uh all this stuff uh this stuff applies so you still need uh 1000 feet vertical separation uh vertically and 1500 meters horizontal separation but then you also need eight kilometers visibility okay so those are your pretty much your weather restrictions there so, how can you get your weather? Well, there's numerous ways. Obviously, if you are familiar with Flight Simulator, with stuff from Vatsim, then you probably use real-world weather. If you don't use real-world weather, then obviously you're going off standard pressure settings, standard temperature, all that jazz, which I'd assume that you're very familiar with already. Uh, if not, just put something down in the comment section below. I'll fill you in with some information, but it's quite simple to research. Uh, but pretty much where to get data, uh, where to get your weather data from? Yeah, you've got your ATIS. So say if I'm at Shoreham, I'll and um, I'm on that sim. Like I say, it's very rarely manned, but Gatwick always is. I'll probably try and tune the Gatwick ATIS, get some information for that. Uh, then you've also got Active Sky as well. Uh, like I say, if you want to bring that up, like I'm going to do here, you can go get some weather off them. So just let that load up for a second. So Echo Golf, Kilo Alpha, you can go get some weather from here. And as you can see, wind 22014. 
few clouds 4900 and like i say you'll also need to factor that in as well for when it comes to flight planning uh where were we yes temperatures 11 dew point 08 the qnh 1018 now also something you can do as well which is very helpful especially flying if uh, especially if you're flying in the uk or northwestern europe so i'd say uh belgium netherlands scandinavia Fra North France, the UK, this is going to be very helpful to you. And that's the Met Office, okay? Because uh, obviously the Met Office, they do quite a lot of weather. If you've got aviation services, what you want to do is you want to go off, make an account, and this is what it's going to come up with. This is mine here. And if you, what you want to do, you can easily go and search some airport weather, like I say. So this is Gatwick's, like so. You can go ahead, you can search airports if you want to. Tafs, Metars, pretty much the same thing. You can pretty much get any any from all over the world, really, if you want. Uh, regional forecast, let's say you've got Sigmets, regional pressure charts. So here in the UK, obviously, um, we have different pressure setting regions. This is giving you all the, uh, all the settings there, like so. Very simple, but I'd say the best one, or the one that I find the most uh, helpful, is the briefing chart. So here we've got a surface pressure chart. And as you can actually have a look here, we've got a bit of a cold front down south and a bit of a cluded front up north. So the QNH 1012 and it's actually 1018, so there's actually a little bit of a difference there. And it gives you a good idea of obviously what's going off in regards of obviously your pressure. But this here is also a very helpful one as well. Because this form here, or chart, whatever you want to call it, Foxtrot 215 UK Low Level Forecast Chart, is going to give you your low level weather most applicable to VFR in the UK. If you want the European one, you've got to click this one. And these ones here, th these are the wind charts. So we'll just have a quick look at the winds. Yep, you see here, these are all the wind charts. Like so, very helpful. But this is pretty much your forecast below uh, flight level 100. So for us, the most applicable one will be A. So just give that a quick read. Surface visibility and weather. We've got 30 kilometers now, isolated seven kilometers showers. Isolated 3,500, uh, yeah, isolated 200 fog. I actually need to get out. I've actually got a little terminology book for all this. I need to try and dig that out. Isolated hill fog, I know that one. Cloud. Okay, we've got some isolated, scattered, broken, cumulus, scattered. That means we've got some moderate icing with some moderate turbulence between 2,000 feet, 3,500 feet. And, and like I say, you can just give that a bit of a read. It's very, very helpful. Zero degrees or freezing point is between 1,500 2,500 feet. And, and like I say, you can just give that a bit of a read if you want to. Uh, for me, I sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Like I say... Um, uh, on flight sim, uh, this is helpful to read because I'd actually say that this is actually still quite um, applicable for flight sim because you will witness quite a lot of this stuff if you are using a realistic weather engine. But then, like I say, uh, if you just want to just get up and see what it's like when you get up, uh, the good thing about flight sim is it does allow you to do that. So, like I say, it's entirely up to you whether or not you want to use this or not. It's just an option available to you section we're going to talk about is flight planning now when it comes to flight planning there's a few things we need to take into consideration we start on some rules of the air now there's a 500 foot vertical separation rule which practically means you need to be 500 feet vertically separated from what i regard as practically everything uh, the actual rule is uh, you need to be 500 feet vertically separated from any person vessel vehicle or structure uh, which practically means at the end of the day, uh, don't go low, below 500 feet um, AGL. So let's just say you're flying over a bit of landmass, that's 100 feet above sea level. Then, in effect, you need to be 600 feet above sea level, 500 feet above that ground. Now, there's also a 1,000 foot vertical separation rule. Now, this is in effect in busy, densely populated areas like cities. Uh, just see if I can give you an example here. We'll talk about all that in a second, so we'll just bring up our map here. So Brighton would be a good example. Now, this rule states that we need to be a 1,000 feet vertically separated from the highest datum, or the highest point within that area. So the highest point around here for Brighton is 554, plus 1,000 feet on that, 1,554 feet. So we could round that up, so we'll say we need to be above 1,600 feet within this area. That's essentially how you do it. Very, very simple, and we also need to be 600 metres uh, horizontally separated as well.
Now, if you're actually following stuff like rivers and stuff like that, so here we've got some roads, we've got some rivers. For me, I commonly follow uh, commonly follow this road all the way up to this intersection before then heading directly east out towards Haywards Heath before go, uh, crossing the Gatwick Control Zone. You always want to remain right, okay? Whenever you're following anything fixed like that, roads, rivers, railways, anything like that, always remain to the right, okay? And there's a very important reason for that. And that's obviously to ensure that if anyone else is coming in the opposite direction, well, then they're also on the right. So that way you're not going to, you know, hit into each other. So there's also something called the quadrant rule or the semicircular rule. Quite simply, um, if you're flying above the transition level and below flight level 245, if you're on a heading of 0 to 89 degrees, you need to be at an odd level. So 3,000 feet, for example, if you're heading between 090 to 179 it needs to be odd plus 500 feet, so 3,500 feet. Heading 180 to 269, it's got to be even, so say 2,000 feet. Heading 270 to 359, it's got to be even plus 500. And like I say, this is, all this is effective above the transition level and below flight level 245. If you're below the transition level, now when I do an awful lot of flying, I do an awful lot of flying around this area. I very rarely go above the transition zone ever when I fly VFR, in which case if you're going... Uh, pretty much eastbound 0 to 180 degrees keep at an odd level uh, anything opposite so 180 to about 360 sort of thing then you want to keep at an even level very very simple so yeah 0 to 180 keep at an odd so about 181 to 359 uh, sorry that should be 0 to 179 I do apologize for that 0 to 179 that should be at odd and then 180 to 359 that should be at even VRPs you've probably already seen this VRPs are visual reference points. As you see here, we've got quite a lot of stuff that's labelled VRPs. Now, these are very highly visual points that uh, you can easily point out, even on something like Flight Simulator. And they're used for a number of things, really. So, like, one of the things that you'll learn when you actually... Well, I'm telling you how to cross-controlled uh, uh, airspace is they may come on and say, en exit the zone via the Hayward T VRP. And that's pretty much what they are, visual reference points. Very, very self-explanatory. So here you've got one for uh, Tun... I always call it Tunbridge, not Tunbridge. T-U-M instead of T-U-N. Uh, Tunbridge Wells. And also, uh, I'll just quickly show you as well something when I can actually bring it back up. So these here, this is a book with all the, air, um, all the airports in Britain. And it also gives you some very helpful information about uh, local flying procedures within that. Uh, a lot of these will actually contain uh, radial bearings for stuff like that as well. So, obviously, if you want to go get that, you can do. Radials and GPS, like I say, radials, uh, you're probably familiar with that from uh, IFR flying. You can pretty much use them in the same way. It can also be used uh, as a primary form of navigation. So, let's say using radials, you let's just bring the, you want to navigate, uh, I don't know, from Mayfield to Biggin Hill. That's a bit of a bad example. So, let's say Mayfield to Lima Yankee Delta to Sierra Foxtrot Delta. No, you can't see that, but Sierra Foxtrot Delta. Golf Whiskey Charlie, then uh, you can do that using radials, uh, even though that's actually VOR to VOR. Um, yeah, I've just kind of got myself mixed up there. I do apologise. Um, so, yeah, that's also another type of uh, navigation form you can use. If you want to use uh, VOR to VOR, you can do that within VFR navigation as a primary source. If you want to use radials, so let's just say using the uh, ruler there and my protractor, uh, you put them on the map, let's just say you want to find out what the radial is there from a reference point of view of Mayfield. Uh, you can do that if you want to do that. And um, Yeah, for me, I do it constantly. Like, uh, I'm going to give you a bit of a better example in a second, okay? Because I've got a bit of an exercise which I can go through to show you with. And that will hopefully uh, make this a little bit clearer, just in case it's a little bit confusing. Uh, GPSs, uh, you can't use GPS for primary navigation. Uh, it is helpful though uh, for airspace awareness, uh, like I say when I commonly fly the Cessna 182, that's got a GPS in it uh, from A to A. Uh, for me it's very helpful knowing my vicinity uh, between where I currently am and uh, where the actual Gatwick airspace starts. So obviously it's very helpful in that regard and it's also just a, uh, you can also use it just to confirm where you are. So let's just say I think I'm about, uh, I don't know, overhead Hayward Heath itself. Now, you can actually get some GPSs that um, 
are actually used for uh, VFR, so it may actually come up with the Hayward Heath, the RP and the GPS. Uh, I'm not aware of any GPS that has that feature with any flight simulator, so therein lies one of the problems. Uh, but still, it's very helpful for knowing your vicinity within the Gatwick uh, vicinity within the airspace. So it's pretty much almost halfway, just beyond halfway. So yeah, you could use that just as a bit of a help to understand a bit more precisely uh, where you are on the map. Obviously, you'll have to use it within reference uh, to a map as well. But yeah, as long as you're not using it for primary uh, navigation, then you're totally fine with that. Headings. Now, obviously, when flying, obviously, uh, I keep using obviously a lot. So when you're flying, obviously, you need to put in a route. So with IFR, like I say, let's just say we're going from London Gatwick to Heathrow. That could be something like the... Uh, I forgot, there used to be some uh, delting to alpha departure, that will take you out via something like that, but then if you go into Heathrow, you do something like the big in, and then let's just say something like, I don't know, like the big in free alpha departure, and then the Lambourne free alpha. Uh, you pretty much, uh, you can do a route pretty much the same way uh, within VFR, except you don't use IFR fixers, uh, you pretty much use more VFR, and just to explain how that works, uh, you can navigate using roads, rivers, railways, or in big towns like this, and uh, just give me a second, I've lost my train of thought, yes, and obviously when it actually comes to plotting your heading, so let's just say we actually want to go to Burgess Hill, what you can do is you need to go ahead and you need to plot your heading, now maps like this, they all take reference from True North, okay? So when you put your protractor on here and your ruler, uh, let's just pretend that's heading of 040. That'll be heading of 040 True. Now, because the plane's compass doesn't work within True, it works within magnetic, you need to convert it over to magnetic, okay? Because all compasses would work off the magnetic North Pole. Okay, so like I say, you need to convert that, and that's what's called variation, okay? So, you need to understand, firstly, how much variation you need to apply. Now, on the map, you're going to have some things like 1.5 west uh, shown, and that's going to give you your variation, okay? Now, obviously, sometimes you may need to add this, you may need to subtract this, and the best way to remember is this. West is best, east is least. So, by saying that west is best, you need to add on to the heading, okay? So, it's going to be a greater number than what you originally have. So, the way I like to think of it is west plus east minus, okay? So, we'll just bring up the map again. Now, I do apologise that I can't show this. Now, I did actually record a video of me doing this, but for some odd reason, my iPhone does not want to upload it to anything else, not even my uh, iCloud server. So, uh, you see this line here, this dash purple line, this here is a variation line. Now, I'm actually looking at this actual map itself, that's 0 0.5. Okay, so I'll tell you what I'm going to do, I'm just going to get notepad up, so we'll just make a note of that. So, we've got a true heading, let's just say, of 0 0.40, so we've got a variation of 0 0.5, so we need to plus that, so we've now got a heading of... 040.5, but then that's not the only thing we also need to apply. We also need to apply something called deviation. Now, deviation takes into account the magnetic field within the aircraft itself, because that magnetic field will distort the compass heading slightly, okay? And there's usually a card uh, just underneath the compass uh, that will give you some information about how to correct this. So, for example, if you want to fly a heading of 270 degrees, it might say fly heading 268 degrees. Okay, so let's just pretend in this instance we need to take away two. Like I say, you can get more precise information on that from the aircraft itself. It's very rare that I don't find a uh, add-on aircraft that uh, doesn't have this feature within flight sim. Okay, so let's just pretend it's minus two. Okay, so minus two, so that would be, I don't know, eight, nine, ten. So that would be heading 038.5. So that's the heading we'd need to fly. But, there's also something else we need to take into consideration, and that's the wind. Now, uh, let's just bring up a map again. So, let's just say we want to go straight to Burgess Hill. But, let's just say we've got some wind uh, coming from our right. So, it's pretty much heading of about 350, or coming, fr uh, well, pretty much heading, uh, I don't know, about 150. It's coming from 350. Then, uh, what we actually, no, sorry, I can't even... This just proves how rusty I am when it comes to quite a lot of stuff. Let's just pretend we've got a uh, wind of 350. That's where the wind is coming from. 
so it's actually going out towards the right okay so let's just say we that's our intended track here out towards Burgess Hill so what's actually going to happen with the wind is it's going to blow us right okay so that might be our desired track but with the wind we might actually end up going somewhere around here okay and that's why you do need to take into account the wind okay because it is going to push you off course so normally the way you would get around that is you need to fly a little bit more into wind so i would adjust my course to the left okay to take that into account now in order to make that calculation you need something called a crp5 or an EF, uh, efb6 it's pretty much like a fancy wheel with some cards that you mainly use for vfr low level uh, navigation really and you can put a load of information in about the wind and your desired track and it's going to tell you what actual heading you should fly so we may actually end up with a nose point in something like uh, I don't know 360 degrees and it may actually uh, let me just repeat that so we may actually have to fly with a nose at 360 degrees but then the wind could actually push us on course, okay? So that's actually quite normal. Now, like I say, in order to make that calculation, you need something like a CRP5 or an EF6. I do have one, uh, but they're about £80. So from if you're just planning on doing just normal VFR navigation and flight sim, you're not planning on doing it in real life, this may be a little bit expensive. So a common way that I... A common thing that I usually do to get around this is... Um, Obviously, we've got a heading there about 038, which is about about there, sort of. And let's just pretend that the wind is going to blow us right of track. Now, in good visibility, you could visually identify this with good scenery. So, obviously, easily from back here, I could easily recognise that, you know, there's a landmass in front of me, which is Burgess Hill. So, for me, I could be about here. So, at which point, I may only uh, correct my course by a few degrees. So, it could actually take us flying directly over the... Uh, area itself so like i say in clear visibility you could easily identify if you're drifting off course or not okay so uh with that being all said and done i've got a bit of an exercise and like i say i do apologize i did record this but my iphone just doesn't want to upload it now for us we're going to pretend we're going to be doing a flight from shoreham up to dame's hall aerodrome here i do apologize it's a little bit unclear now using the most up-to-date weather information because uh, we do need to take that into account. The wind 22014 means we'll be departing Shoreham runway 21, which is pretty much a uh, runway parallel with the coastline. Now, like I say, within that uh, itself, if you do have one of these, let me just bring it up. If you do have one of these manuals, obviously it's very helpful to refer to that. I referred to that, and there's nothing we need to take into consideration for takeoff. So, we also need to decide where our first point's going to be. Now, for me, I want my first point to be there, okay? And the reason I want it to be there is because uh, today's flight plan up towards Dames Hall, uh, we want it outside of controlled airspace, okay? So, we're not going to be going in there. But, like I say, I will show you how to do it. Now, already doing this, I can already tell you there that if we want to actually take a radial bearing. So, if you, are, if you haven't got the best scenery, and um, plus... As you can see, there's not really too much uh, around there that will actually visually tell us we're over that area. The only real thing that we could use is pretty much in reference to the fact that there's a, there's a junction there. And really, the only way we could identify that visually is just by being right of that. But it's not the most accurate. So this is where I would use a radial. So one of the best radials we could use would be Mayfield. So I've already measured this. So Mayfield... Uh, the distance would be 14.5 degrees at 264, uh, sorry, 14.5 nautical miles at 264 degrees, okay? So that could be our first fix there. Okay, so from that, we can then head out towards Haywards Heath VRP and then pretty much start tracking out towards Mayfield. Now, we will have to be very careful about that because we will need to uh, avoid controlled airspace. So taking a heading or uh, bearing uh, from that and obviously doing all the calculations relative towards that, what we then need to do is we then need to fly on a heading of 094 degrees. Uh, well, I think it is. Yeah, we need to fly on a heading of 094 degrees and that would be for about 10, 15 miles. And then Mayfield, you could just simply track that. That's going to be about 10 miles. Then from that, we'll be heading out towards Tunbridge Wells. Uh, yet again, we have some radial information for that. I'm just trying to find it because unfortunately I've lost it. Uh, but like I say, it is actually in that book. So that's one of the things you can do. You can bring that up. 
and then obviously uh, we'd be heading up to Seven Oaks, and then we'd be pretty much following the M25 out towards Dame, uh, Dame's Hall. So that's just pretty much an example there of plotting. Okay, so uh, we'd write down the radial for that. Uh, we'd write down the distance and the heading we need to fly to reach Haywards Heath. Same thing for Mayfield, same thing for Tunbridge Wells, etc. So, uh, just to give you a bit of an example how a plot may look. I mean, you can actually get some paper for this, uh, but for me, I like to do it in my own way. So, call it Fix 1, Mayfield uh, 117.9, Radial 26, uh, Radial 264. And that was at 14.5 nautical miles. Okay. So then next thing I'm going to go to is fix number two. That's Haywards Heath. VRP, like I say, that might be heading 092 magnetic. And that might be at 10 nautical miles. So, like I say, that's one of the ways you can do it. If you've seen an IFR flight plan, it will give you headings, altitudes, and all that stuff, etc. Now, in regards of altitude, we can do that now. So, like I say, we need to take into account the 1,000 feet rule. So, already, I've already gone ahead and calculated this. Now, even though we are technically over 600 meters separated, I will st uh, still take into account this big tower here. Obviously, as you can see, it's quite self-explanatory. So 554, so 1554 is uh, what we need to maintain. Round that up, 1600, but then we also need to be at an odd level because we are heading east. We'll call that 1900. That should also see us a uh, little bit of margin for error as well to ensure we don't enter the class alpha airspace. And it also means we are flying at a good level low enough so we can actually see some ground. Uh, we can actually visually see some ground positions, like I said, like Hayward T, VRP, and the Tunbridge Wells. So pretty much from that uh, Haywards Heath, 1,900 feet, we can still remain there, tracking out towards Mayfield. As you can see, pretty much avoiding this airspace, because at 1,900 feet, we would enter Gatwick. And like I say, this is where GPS can also come in helpful as well. Uh, that's to ensure that you don't obviously enter that airspace. Then we we'll head out towards Tunbridge Wells. We've got a big tower here, so we need to add... Uh, now, this is not in a densely populated area, so we could actually add 500 feet to that. So 5, 6, 7, 8, 1,800... So about 1,800 feet would, uh, 1,805 feet uh, would be uh, the altitude we'd need for this area. So at 1,900, so that's fine. But because we generally want to be separated from at least 600 meters from that object, leaving Tunbridge Wells, we can pretty much head out towards Seven Oaks, which uh, we could pretend is on a heading of 350 and magnetic at, uh, ooh, let's call it seven miles. Uh, then what can we do? Uh, then we can pretty much just follow the M25 as a fixed position, making sure we are keeping right. Out towards the uh, Thames Astra here, and pretty much for flying north, and then we should be able to visually identify Dame's Hill, and then we can enter the circuit. So that's pretty much it. Very, very simple. Okay, so that's one of the things we can write down here. 1,900 feet cruise. Okay, so now, as you can see, we have all of the data, but also one of the things as well we also need to know is about flight plan filing. So I'm actually just going to bring up vPilot here like so. Uh, let that load and we'll go here. So quite simply to do it on something like uh, this, you need to go to VFR. If you're doing special VFR, you'll put that in. Don't even know what dVFR is. Still, this is what you do. You want to make sure you get rid of all this information like so. And like I say, a lot of this is actually made up. But uh, it doesn't matter in today's case. So Echo Golf Kilo Romeo, Dames Hill. I've forgotten what it is. I think it's Echo Golf Kilo Romeo. I'm not too sure. Let's just pretend it is Echo Golf Kilo Romeo. Alternative will be uh, South End. Uh, the parts time quite normal. Let's just uh, assume we'll get airborne at 1800 hours. Uh, time in route uh, will be about an hour. Total fuel available 315. Like I say, you'll you'll need to enter this uh, as applicable. Obviously, uh, because I've had to kind of do a bodge job with this uh, on the computer, I can't really get too much accurate information, I'm afraid. Uh, cruising speed, yeah, that's also affected by the wind as well, and this is also why you need a CRP5, uh, CRP5 for that. But for me, I most times put 100 to 105. Uh, cruising level will be 1,900, like I say, as agreed. 
And that's pretty much it. If you want to just go straight off that, you can do. And nine times out of ten, I would do that because I may vary the route depending if there's any adverse weather. So, for example, we could actually end up coming over Tunbridge Wells, and there could, be, and it could, and you know, there could be some low cloud around there. So I could actually adjust my course to actually head out more eastward to avoid that. So for me, this is generally why I don't put in more than that. But if you want to, you can do something like this. So Ekagov, Kilo Alpha, uh, out towards uh, Haywards Heath, uh, VRP, Mayfield, Tunbridge, VRP. So yeah, if you want to do that, you can do. Uh, if you are going to following a specific route and you know you are, but for me personally, uh, I don't do that. But like I say, fl uh, filing a flight plan VFR, extremely simple, okay? And uh, if you are just getting into it and you're still practicing about, and if you are going to be practicing a bit about on that sim, then obviously this is the kind of format I would recommend. Uh, remarks, you don't have to put anything in with that. For me, I always uh, just put that in. But as long as you've got all this information filled, then that's totally fine. You do not... You do not have to enter a specific route when it comes to VFR flying. Okay, so the next thing we're going to discuss is about circuits. Now, just in case you're unfamiliar with what circuits are, essentially it's the procedure uh, for landing into uh, most uncontrolled airfields, okay? Now, some standard entry procedures for the circuits. Uh, most commonly referred to as an overhead join. Uh, a, lot, a lot of times when you are going into an uncontrolled airfield, you will do something what's called an overhead join. Now, the reason you do this is that quite a lot of uncontrolled airfields in real life, they have some symbols on the ground, which mean various things such as what runway's in use, uh, if you keep to a hard surface or not, uh, if it's a right-hand circuit in force, all movements, like I say, need to be on a hard surface, or if the landing's prohibited. Like I say, uh, these are referred to as ground-to-air signals, okay? Don't worry about this within flight sim, okay? This is not functional. I have seen a few airfields that do have them simulated, but then obviously they're not going to change, are they? So let's just say, for instance, uh, it's saying that we need to land on runway 220, two but the wind is 020 two zero degrees. It will; Those ground signals will say you should land on 20, uh, when in actual fact you should land on 02 because it's preferable for the wind. So... Yeah, uh, but then still, you can still do an overhead join uh, if you, uh, you want to. I do recommend that you do do that. Usually, most overhead joins are accomplished at 2,000 feet above ground level. Before then, you go off and join the circuit. Stand circuit height is usually 1,000 feet above ground level for most uh, UK uncontrolled airfields. And, I've, and yet again, not applicable for flight sim. Sometimes it may be. Uh, they may have like a tower controller on Ryan, and obviously, you need to call them up as necessary. Yeah, uh, the times when it's come and shore them. Uh, when I fly in and out of there, it's pretty much a scenario that I'm calling up and request uh, airfield information, stuff like that. Right, so, uh, well, that would, sorry, that would actually be your first call if they are online. Just uh, ring them up and ask for airfield information, and uh, I'd just ask for the circuit, really. Like I say, it will vary constantly, and it's one of these things you do need to get practice on. But then, I've, like I say, it's only really that one scenario that I've ever seen any sort of uncontrolled airfield manned within Shoreham and that's within having three years experience actually on that sim flying VFR all around the UK. You'll never see anything like Dames Hill, uh, Dames Hall uh, airfield manned like we've just discussed. The most likely one, like I say, would be Shoreham, but even that's still quite a rare thing. Right, moving on. This here is a basic circuit diagram, as you can see there. Straight taking off from the runway, keeping on runway heading, that's called upwind. Then when you start your first turn, that's crosswind. That's downwind, that's base, that's final. So, how essentially do you actually come in over the airfield? Well, this is what's referred to as the live side. And this is what's referred to as the dead side. Now, when you come over the airfield, you're going to come uh, so about 2,000 feet above the ground level. Now, here on the dead side, this is where you actually want to descend to circuit height. Like I say, some circuit heights can vary. I know at Shoreham, as mentioned in the... Um, in the booklet that I showed you previously, where all you've got all you know the airfield diagrams and all the information etc. It's 1,100 feet. So if this was one of Shoreham's runways, uh, the west east runway, I'd come over the airfield at 2,000 feet, see what the gist is, and then on the dead side I would descend uh, to uh, 1,100 feet for Shoreham, 
I also need to point out that if this is the West East runway, I think it would be a right-hand circuit in force. But let's just pretend, for sake of argument, that it's a left-hand uh, uh, left circuit in force. Like I say, this here is a left-hand circuit, the opposite way if it's a right one. But yeah, this here is a dead side. I'd descend to 1,000 feet on this side. And then what I'd do is uh, I would... Uh, on the dead side and make a descending turn into the circuit direction to the circuit height remaining on the dead side like I say and then I'd pass it with the upwind end of the runway level at circuit height now that does seem quite confusing but to make a long story short here I'll descend to circuit height 1000 feet come over the runway here which is pretty much the um, upwind end of the runway and I'll join the crosswind at a thousand feet before then making the circuit. Now, a few things you need to remember about the circuit is whatever traffic is lower, they have uh, the priority to land. So let's just say I am here at 1,000 feet and already there's another plane here at 500 feet on the descent to land. They have the priority. This plane would have the priority to land. Of course, do not overtake or cut anyone up. Uh, within this approach okay because you can actually overtake planes uh, within the air it's very rare that you do see it on VATSIM because VFR is actually quite rare but in case you should uh, need to ever overtake anyone but I personally do not recommend doing it in the circuit then you always want to overtake to the right if you ever head on with another airplane make sure you both go to the right and if you're converging yet again it's also to the right as well like I say everything's pretty much right once you're in the air so, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. A very, very basic uh, thing, obviously. Uh, if you are coming in from the south, then uh, one of the things that I usually do is remaining at 2,000 feet here. I'll cross the runway, get a bit of a gist, and then I'll try and get into the dead side as quickly as possible. Descend to 1,000 feet before then joining the crosswind, like I say, at circuit height. Uh, like I say, uh, for the most part, I usually come in from the north. So for me, coming in from the north here, 2,000 feet, looking out the window, seeing what the situation is, turning dead side, coming up here, sort of like a right downwind in the opposite direction, descending to 1,000 feet, coming in now, and then pretty much into the circuit. That's pretty much how it works. Very, very simple. Uh, like I say, I will be uh, showing you a video about how to do uh, the circuit uh, shortly. This is going to be after this video here. Because I do need to talk a little bit about altimetry. Now, usually in the UK, the transition level uh, ranges from 4,000 to 6,000 feet. Uh, Q&H, just in case you're not familiar with that, that's local pressure. As I've already talked about earlier. The uh, local pressure, essentially, is the pressure that you'll need to tune in on your altimeter. That will give you height above main sea level. Shorm, I think, is about 7 feet. So, generally, your altimeter is going to be pretty much zero when you tune that in. Let's pretend that's on 1014. Uh, so that's what you use to get your height above, like I say, main sea level. Now, if you're used to flying stuff like Boeing's uh, on there, they actually have something called Barrow and Radio. Uh, that obviously you use for setting the minimums. Barrow is, like I say, your height above main sea level. Uh, radio. Now, if, you concept with, if you're familiar with the concept of a radio altimeter, if you're on the ground, that will read zero. Okay? And that's essentially where QFE comes into play. QFE is a setting you'll most commonly use for circuits because it's AGL. That will uh, set your height above the ground level. So if I set the Q&H of 1014 uh, and I've got 1,000 feet, but then the airport elevation is at 100 feet, then already, as you can see there, it's a little bit inaccurate because it's actually 900 feet. Okay, so by setting the QFE, you actually get your height above the actual airfield itself. And that's very, very helpful for the circuits. Now, there's a certain way in which you can do that. Obviously, Shorm is a bit of a bad example because it's pretty much an airport at sea level. But 30 feet equals 1 hectopascal, the standard setting in Europe. So, to get QFE, what you need to do is you need to get the airfield height. Say, for instance, uh, the airfield's got a height of 90 feet above main sea level. This is equal to 3 HBA. And you've got a Q&H of 1020. All you simply need to do in that is take away 3 HPA and it's going to equal 1016 for the QFE. Now, if you're at some places like Manchester and you want to do circuits, uh, you will tune your QFE in and the ATIS will give you that. But I'll now show you a bit more from a visual perspective how all that works. So I'm going to explain to you a bit of altimetry. Now, currently, we're on the ground here at Manchester. This is Echo Charlie Charlie. Now, I've set the weather up 
so that way we have a Q&H of 1020. Now, if you want to just get your Q&H randomly on the ground, there's a very simple way of doing it. Now, firstly, what you need to do is you need to go off and you need to find out what the airport's height is, its elevation. Now, Manchester is 257 feet, so ideally, we're going to be looking there on the altimeter. And quite simply, to get the Q&H without relying on something like the ATIS, all you need to simply do is put the dial over to there like so. So, as you can see there, 1020 is the Q&H. Now, obviously, when it comes to the UK, we have different pressure setting regions. Obviously, they will... Uh, vary uh, with the because um, obviously when it comes to pressure obviously it's never constant so it's likely that it's going to be different in different parts of the UK of course you do have some charts which can actually help you out in that but either way like I say you can use stuff like active sky or you could use this method to get it like I say if you don't have uh, access to you know active sky usually I just pull this down and active sky is available but I've not got it running so this is one of the ways you can actually do it now, let's just say that you have got Active Sky running, and it has given you the Q&H, 1020. And let's just say it was in the air, and we wanted to land at Manchester, but we wanted the QFE. So, in this instance, like, if you used to fly stuff like uh, 737, 747s like I am, you're going to see something on the minimums, which indicates both barrow and radio. Now, for me, I refer to this as a barometric setting, which it actually is, which refers to high above main sea level. But then you also have one for above ground level or radio now this is very very helpful in circuits especially at uncontrolled airfields where you actually need to be a thousand feet agl not amsl so what you need to do is you need to set the qfe now usually if you come in somewhere like manchester which is controlled airspace the atish could usually give you that uh if it's an uncontrolled airfield uh what normally could happen in real life this is one of the ways you can do it is you can give the airfield a bit of a call and request some airfield information and obviously because this is flight sim that's not really available now is it but one of the things you can do is this now what you need to do is what i regard as convert the airport's altitude into hpa now you need to remember that one hectopascal is equal to 30 feet now here at manchester it's, the airport elevation is about 259 feet so you're looking for about 260 so 3 6 9 12 15 18 21 24 27 so we've got about eight or nine hectopascals so what you want to do is you want to take that away from the q and h so we're looking for about one zero uh one two one zero one one and that should actually read about zero as you can see there it's gone in the red a bit so we'll put it for one zero two zero and bingo that is practically naught so that will be a very good way of getting your qfe just in case uh everything else should actually fail okay so there's still a few things i do need to talk to you about uh, some circuits can be non-standard, so there could be uh, right-hand circuit in force. Uh, you could vary on the heights, like I've just explained for Sherbet, Sherbet, uh, Shoreham. A uh, good place you can get that from is that can be available in the similar place you go and get all your information uh, from on the NAPS website. So if you're someone that does not have access to charts and you are quite reliant on you know, free stuff, then that's obviously a good place you can go on, especially for the UK, go on the NAPS website where you can obviously uh, dig out all that information. Obviously, if you need a bit of a help with that, uh, put something down in the comment section. I'll uh, see what I can do uh, from that point of view. Uh, but for me, I actually have that little book that I showed you earlier. That book is obviously uh, very, very helpful, and it's easily referenced. Of course, if you want to buy one of them, I will be doing a separate video about all the equipment you can actually get uh, to get stuff like that. And I'll give you a bit more of a link to that there. Obviously, if air traffic control is in force... Um, we are starting to now touch up on the last topic, which is ATC procedures. If it's somewhere like Sean, which is uncontrolled, uh, you should always give them a ring before breaching the airspace, before breaching the ATZ. But quite simply, all you need to do in the case of like Sean is just request airfield information, and they'll tell you uh, something like uh, Golf Oscar Romeo, runway 32 in use, left hand circuit, QNH 1025. And then, obviously, with that, I'll, I'll be like, uh, showroom, tower, golf, Oscar X-ray, request airfield information and to join the circuit. And they'll, you know, just say pretty much that. And they'll also add on something like join left base runway 32. Even in controlled airspace, if you've got permission from the radar control to go into that airspace, and then you're subsequently wanting to land, 
then uh, or join the circuit then pretty much just call the tower up and just say hello would like to uh, make a full stop landing or a go around or whatever you want and then nine times out of ten they'll tell you to join a left base for way three two and obviously this is a situation obviously with that sim not like I say I'm not too sure I'm pretty sure it would be if uh I'm pretty sure, like I say, this procedure for that sim, I do apologise, I'm getting tongue twisted. I would imagine it will be the same for IVAO and Pilot Edge, but I'm not 100% sure. Like, I don't even know anything about Pilot Edge. I don't even know if it's even effective in the UK. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much it. So I'll now go off and I'll show you how to do a circuit. Right, so okay everyone, so at this moment in time, we're 2,000 feet above Shoreham, as you can see here. Uh, today traffic is landing on <coughs> runway uh, 25 here so as you can see uh, we're coming over the airfield now heading over to the dead side at 2,000 feet and it's actually at the northern side of the runway which today is a dead side because it's a left hand circuit in course where we'll then descend to 1,100 feet according to the uh, procedures here at uh, Shoreham See, it's getting a little bit bumpy. Uh, we have got real-world weather on. As you can see there, Shoreham doesn't have those uh, symbols that I talked about earlier. Still, nice view there. And the runway looks in uh, good nick as well. Right, let's take it down. So usually at Shoreham, you would not descend until you've actually got permission, because air traffic control uh, is always here in real life. Well, I say that. Uh, it's always here during the uh, operational hours, okay, because that's also something you have to take into consideration in real life when you're flying, is the airport's operational hours, because it may only be from like half eight in the morning to like uh, ten o'clock at night, at which point obviously when it's closed there'll be uh, no ATC online. But uh, for the most part of that sim, if it's uncontrolled, then uh, obviously you don't need uh, clearance, you just uh, descend as needed. So you're pretty much just following Unicom procedures really. I'm just going to triple check my Q&H. Now, because Shum is actually practically at sea level, uh, you can tune the Q&H fine. Uh, there'll be no real problem with that. So see there, Q&H 1018. So what we're going to try and do now is we'll try and get down to 1,100 feet. Okay. We'll try and remain dead side of the runway. And I also do feel it's a little bit easier to do this when there's other traffic. Uh, I really want to try and see if we can actually uh, get something like a VFR session going at some point with some people. That'd be really fun. Airspeed a little bit fast. Adjust a vertical speed. 1,500 there. No, that's okay. You always want to keep an eye out for other traffic, but I'm not online and I don't have any AI. Okay, so we're approaching pretty much 1,100 feet now. And what we want to do is we want to overfly the dead uh, upwind dead side of the runway. So in this case, it's uh, here. So you're pretty much flying over the threshold of the opposite runway, like so, into the circuit. We're a little bit low here. We'll put a bit more power on the airplane. So it just is a bit bumpy today. So we'll try and get a bit higher. For some odd reason should normally stay level. This is also where so things like rudder trim can come in very handy, especially for like these type of airplanes. Okay, so there we go. We are now in the circuit. This is the uh, crosswind leg. Just adjust the power slightly. And we'll trim her out. And we'll start to make a left turn. Whoa. today so yep yeah, we'll uh, start to fly the uh, downwind leg
like so, and we can pretty much use the coast as a reference point. And we can actually start descending now before going to the base leg. Bridge feels really unstable today. There we go. So we'll take the power off a bit. See, we are flying a little bit faster, just the vertical speed. Because uh, we're going to let the uh, needle come within that white band. So obviously we can start putting some flaps out. Watch for objects as we go. Good, and we'll start turning. There we go, we can have flaps one. Keeping up the turn nine to the base leg. Obviously, throughout all this time, uh, if it's uncontrolled, you can let people not uh, know what you're doing via Unicom. But then, obviously, I only give very basic call-outs, you know, something like uh, Shuram Traffic, I'm landing on 2-4. Uh, like I say, that's why I've got Vatastic. It's a very helpful tool. It's like having TCAS in something like this. So if there's no other traffic in the area, then uh, I keep the radio calls to a minimum because I don't want to clog up the frequency. You could have quite a lot of traffic landing at Gatwick, and that might not be manned. Right, we'll try and get straight here before we go into final. Put another notch of flap out. By God, she's not wanting to fly stable today. There we go, and that's pretty much really how you do the uh, how you do the circuit. Very very simple. But like I say, if it is confusing to you, just get a little bit of practice in, and you should be okay. Remember, practice makes it perfect. Right on, so on to the uh, last couple of slides. Uh, we're going to talk about air traffic control procedures. So for starters, uncontrolled airspace. Uh, you want to follow Unicom procedures, and I've not written it down, but uh, in the UK, similar to the US, uh, when you're in controlled airspace, you have a generic squawk code which you should use. Uh, for us in the UK, that's 7000, 7000. So obviously, once you're in class golf airspace, that's what you want to use. Now, when you start entering controlled airspace, they're going to give you a squawk code. But let's just say you want to enter it, what do you do? Well, let's just pretend we want to go into Gatwick's airspace. The first thing I'll do is I'll get the ATIS. Get the information, because it's always helpful to have, and then what I'll do is I'll call Gatwick. I'll say Gatwick Radar, hello, Golf, X-Ray Charlie, Delta Echo, PA-28. So, you need Gatwick Radar, your call sign, your aircraft type, two POB. Uh, so, that means you've got two persons on board. Uh, you can state that if you want to, you don't have to. doesn't really matter on flight sim. Uh, two miles south of hands across VRP, uh, that is important, even if it's only an approximate guess. So, for me, I'd probably say approximately two miles south of the Hands Cross VRP. Uh, yeah, you need to give them location. You need to give them your height. So, 1,500 feet VFR. It's important you tell them your VFR. Give them the information you've got relative to the ATIS. And then there's you, and then after that, you state your intention. So, for me, it would probably be request clearance to enter the uh, Gatwick Control Zone for a transit to the north. And we would like to request basic service as well. We'll explain what basic service and all that is in a little bit. And then probably nine times out of ten they'll come across and they'll uh, say back to you, Golf X-Ray, Charlie Delta Echo, clear to enter the Gatwick Control Zone, no above 1,500 feet VFR, squawk 4512, route valid 26 left threshold. See, very, very clear and very self-explanatory. And they'll probably tell you to leave the zone, something via the Godston VRP, stuff like that. And this is also where it's important to have charts as well, because if you don't have charts, you'll be like, uh you won't know what you're doing. Now, if you come into a controlled airspace like Gatwick to land, it's pretty much the same thing. you just got to change it slightly uh, when it actually comes to stating your attention. So, request clearance to enter the zone for a full stop landing to Red Hill. Red Hill, very popular GA airport, as you can see there. Uh, for me, the way I'd use that is a little bit complex. So, let's just say for the weather reasons, I'm restricted to uh, 1,500 feet. Then, obviously, I'd have to go through the Gatwick airspace. Then obviously I'll tell them that I'll obviously want to go into Red Hill, and then obviously they'll route me uh, as required. Now, what should you do if there's no um, controllers on? Well, nine times out of ten, radar will control this area. And for me, when I'm getting a zone crossing, you cross into this airspace. So usually, what will happen? It will be radar tower, and then back to radar. So for me, usually the first protocol is radar. If radar's not online, it's only tower. I'd call them before I enter the CTR. Other than that, I'd pretty much do what I want here. 
Uh, obviously, keeping in mind traffic on the approach as well. And this is also where it's very helpful having something like Baptastic uh, or anything like that where you can actually monitor other traffic. Because if there's no ATC online at all and the approach is just flooded with traffic, then for me, I'd avoid the airspace entirely. You'll be totally, I mean, usually plane start the approach, I'd say, run about here at about 3,000 feet. So to actually cross the zone there would actually be quite tricky. Now, usually planes climb out very fast. So for me, if anything, I'd probably cross the zone about here. But ideally, I'd want to avoid controls there space at all if it's A, busy, and B, there's no controllers online. Okay, and that's just from a safety aspect. Okay, uh, what next? So, how about departing an airfield with air traffic control? We're going to assume Liverpool. Now, one of the things you do need to get is your departure clearance. Very similar to IFR clearance, except it's, a, it's done in VFR language, if that makes sense. So, uh, I'll show you what that is in a second. Uh, startup clearance, uh, this will vary. Because some airplanes you actually need to start the engine so you can get the radios, obviously through AC power. Uh, in which case that's totally fine. Go ahead, start up, get your ATIS and then call for radio check if you want to do that. I always do that. Uh, departure clearance and then your taxi. Pretty much everything after your departure clearance, so it's taxi, takeoff, is pretty much standard. So what do you do? Well, this is how you quest. The, this is what I usually do. I'll first get the ATIS. Pretend it's uh, information mic. Then I'll go on the call sign and say something like, I don't know, Liverpool Radar, Golf, Kilo, Oscar, Romeo, Whiskey, Radio Check, and they'll probably say Readability 5. I'll be like, thank you, Golf, Kilo, Oscar, Romeo, Whiskey, Piper PA28, 2 POP, over at Bravo, Information Mike, QNH1016, Echo Golf, Golf, Papa to Echo Golf, Charlie, Charlie, request departure clearance. And then they'll give you the clearance, and it'll be something like Golf, Kilo, Oscar, Whiskey, Romeo, uh, you're cleared to leave the Liverpool control zone via the... I don't know, Wolverhampton VRP, not above 1,500 feet, squat 2615, something like that. Now, obviously, that, that's just random examples there. I know for a fact that I've got that wrong, but that's how you can expect it to come back. Very, very simple. Now, obviously, when it comes to actually the departure clearance itself, uh, I always tell them where you're at. So, over at Bravo, um, you can say over at GA if you want. Obviously, you have to look on your charts there. Information mic, the QNH1016, that's quite a realistic thing you do in real life, uh, where you would actually give them the QNH over the radio itself. Uh, most, if you don't have the QNH, then don't worry about it, because sometimes the ATIS doesn't work. So, if you don't have the QNH, you can just leave that out, and then they'll give you the QNH afterwards. So, they'll probably say, Golf Kilo Oscar Risky Romeo, thank you, the QNH1016. Very, very simple. Now, I'd also tell them where I'm going to as well. Because in this case, it's Echo Golf Charlie Charlie. And it's only self-explanatory that you'll be heading east. Because Manchester is obviously east of Liverpool. And then obviously, that way, they kind of know that they don't want to be giving you something like a VRP. Which is Seaford, which is off to the west. Just makes sense. Uh, right, so what else? Uh, the services, yep. Yeah, you've got a basic service. This is pretty much just advice and information only. It's the most basic uh, air traffic control service you can get whilst in controlled airspace. Traffic service, this is my preferred one. I do this all the time when I'm in uh, Gatwick's airspace. And basically, it's a basic service, but it'll give you traffic information. So it'll pretty much tell you, oh, uh, Golf Kilo Oscar Risky Romeo, Boeing 747, off to your right, 3 o'clock, 4 miles. All right, next one up is a deconfliction service. Not only will they tell you where the traffic is, they'll also give you some uh, instructions about how to avoid that traffic. A procedural service, I've never ever heard one. Very, very rare. Um, pretty much what they'll do on that is they'll give you instructions to separate from other traffic on a procedural service. I just wouldn't use procedural. Uh, if there's quite a lot of traffic about in the London Gatwick airspace, like I say, yet again, using uh, the deconfliction service, you can always ask for a deconfliction service. They may only give you a basic or a traffic one, but still, um, it's up to the controller's discretion with that. But at the end of the day, that's pretty much it. So, with that being said and done, uh, this video is now complete. Like I say, I certainly hope you've enjoyed it. I certainly hope you've found it enjoyable and informative. And do not forget, if you are new to the channel and want to see more, please make sure you go off and absolutely smash that like button and smash that subscribe button because I'd hate it if you were to miss out on any other videos. Now, the next video that I will be uh, putting up after this will be a few tips and tricks for some other VFR stuff as well. And I'll also be doing sort of like an example flight as well, where we can actually show you how to do stuff like navigate via GPS, navigate via radials, a few AT procedures, stuff like that. So uh, please stay tuned for that. Uh, but from once again, uh, thank you very much from me, The Plane Guy, and I'll see you next time.